So this is some joint work that I've done with uh, Thomas Galley and Flaminia, um, who uh, spoke earlier on in this week. And uh, the, I've called the talk a no-go theorem on the nature of the gravitational field. But I, I also kind of played with another title for it, which is what can generalized probabilistic theories teach us about experimental tests of the nature of gravity? Um, I think there's been a lot of recent interest in this. We've seen other talks in this conference already uh, about the subject of these experimental tests. Um, but I think that uh, generalized probabilistic theories, which I'll explain what they are uh, shortly, uh, provide a new perspective on this problem, and they have interesting things to say, which I hope to get across in this talk. Uh, the, the main conclusion, though, uh, I'll, I'll skip to now, uh, which is the, what do generalized probabilistic theories teach us about this question? Well, they basically teach us that everything is just more complicated than you might have thought already. So if we thought the problem of understanding quantum gravity was difficult, well, maybe it's actually uh, worse. <laughs> So I'm going to start with a couple of disclaimers here uh, before getting into the thing. Uh, the first is that I'm sort of a backup speaker, so I had uh, only a couple of days to prepare these slides. So I think an interesting experiment for you all to do is to watch how the quality of the slides goes up and down uh, as I go through the talk and uh, see how that correlates with how interesting I found the other talks uh, in the last couple of days. <laughs> Um, the second disclaimer is that I'm really not an expert on gravity or quantum gravity. Um, so please don't ask me complicated questions about that stuff. Uh, luckily though, uh, Flaminia is here in the audience who knows a lot more about those things than I do. So feel free to ask her all of those complicated questions that you might have as the talk goes on. <laughs> if you want to know about GPTs, feel free to ask me. <laughs> um, on that subject as well, uh, Flaminia gave a really great uh, talk on this stuff at QPL this year. Uh, the YouTube link is, is here. So for those watching online, feel free to disappear off to that. Uh, for those in person, you're stuck with me for the next few minutes at least. I'll, I'll pause while people escape or take photos of that for watching later. <laughs> okay, so Probably most of you have already heard of this thought experiment uh, that was uh, introduced, I think, by Bose et al. and uh, Maletto and Vedral. And the basic idea is very simple, I think, that you, you start with some particle A that's in a superposition of two different positions. And this is a massive particle. Um, and then we have some other particle, uh, which I've called B, which is sitting some distance away from it. And it's a thought experiment, so let's just presume that we can ensure somehow uh, that there's no other interaction between these two particles aside from the gravitational field uh, that uh, sort of you, you, you can't shield. So, so everything else is shielded, so there's no electromagnetic force between these or anything like that. We just have the gravitational uh, force. And then suppose that some time evolves, um, then what do we expect to happen? Uh, well, there's sort of two options. What, one is that the gravitational field uh, ends up with the interaction between these particles leading to them in, being entangled. On the other hand, maybe they don't become entangled. So this is the thing that we're going to try and test in the experiment, or at least in the thought experiment. We're going to ask, do these two particles become entangled after some amount of time, or do they stay separable as they were at the start? So then the question is, OK, so we've got this thought experiment. There's sort of two possible outcomes. One is we see entanglement. Uh, the other is we don't see entanglement. In those two instances, what can we learn? What can we infer about the nature of the gravitational field from this experiment? So if we see entanglement, can we conclude anything? If we don't see entanglement, can we conclude anything? And I think the standard answer to this is that if we see entanglement in the experiment, then this is good evidence that uh, the gravitational field has to be quantum in some sense. Uh, and if uh, we do not see entanglement, then this sort of means that the gravitational field uh, is classical. And so we're going to take this thought experiment, we're going to put it into the language of generalized probabilistic theories, and we're going to sort of reanalyze this uh, answer. And as I said at the start, things become more complicated when you look at it from this perspective. So 
okay, why, why should GPTs be a good tool to use for asking this kind of question? Uh, why should you be interested in this or, or the talk or Gemini probabilistic theories more generally, I guess? Well, I've got sort of three, three answers to start with. The first is that Gemini probabilistic theories, they sort of apply an operational methodology. Uh, but they apply an operational methodology without sort of any of the ontological uh, commitments that tends to come with thinking operationally. So we can use the tools of operationalism without sort of subscribing to it as a philosophy, without saying that there is nothing more than uh, the probabilities that we see in experiments to, to guide us. Um, so it's sort of a very bare bones formalism uh, that people with all different kinds of uh, perspectives on how nature is and how nature should be uh, can all use and hopefully come to some sort of consensus uh, via this approach. So the, the basic idea behind the formalism is that any theory must, at a minimum, be able to make predictions about the outcomes of experiments. So this doesn't say that they can't do more than that. Uh, theories may, may do a lot more than that. But at a minimum, any theory, any good theory, has to be able to, has to, be able to do that. And so in particular, I think when, when GPTs uh, got going, there was probably the thought that, OK, well, if we have this extremely bare bones formalism that can describe a whole lot, well, maybe it can describe quantum gravity as well. Maybe a hypothetical theory of quantum gravity that we come up with uh, can be uh, cast into the framework uh, and captured by it. This hasn't happened yet, but you know, there's, it might one day. <laughs> I think it's also useful to contrast uh, the generalized probabilistic theory uh, framework to sort of alternative paradigms uh, for studying sort of beyond quantum physics, uh, such as the device independent paradigm. And I think the key difference between these uh, perspectives is that generalized probabilistic theories say that sort of the correlations that you see in an experiment must have some sort of physical explanation for them. Um, it doesn't say what that physical explanation is. Maybe it's some sort of causal explanation, in which case this uh, sort of principle uh, really has a flavor of Reichenbach's common cause, uh, or that correlations must have causal explanations. Um, but again, the formalism, because it's so bare bones, it doesn't make you uh, subscribe to that uh, viewpoint necessarily. But it means that there should be some sort of state, there should be some sort of effects, uh, transformations, and so on. There should be like a conceivable physical theory that underpins the correlations that we see in, in experiments. Um, another approach that people have taken to going beyond quantum theory is just to sort of take the quantum formalism and change some aspect of it. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, a bit later, but what the what generally probabilistic theories teach us is that a lot of these modifications don't really work in that they lead to various inconsistencies. So GPTs give us this bare bones formalism, which ensures that the theory that we get at the end of the day is going to, is going to be consistent. Uh, so the kinds of consistency conditions I mean are that like the probabilities that are predicted by, uh, for outcomes of experiments should be valued in the unit interval. We shouldn't get a negative probability as a prediction because, well, it just wouldn't make any sense at all, right? So what this means, for example, one of the consequences of this is that if we change the measurements in a theory, then that necessarily means we have to reconsider what our states look like. So we can't just change one aspect of the theory without having to at least do consistency checks that the other bits are, are still okay. So I'm now going to sort of uh, briefly introduce uh, what uh, GPTs are in a kind of more formal sense. Luckily, Howard did uh, a lot of work on this uh, yesterday, so hopefully uh, you guys remember that, which makes my life easier. Um, although I'm going to take a slightly different perspective here. In particular, I want to start from imagining that we've got some sort of system, some physical system of some sort. It could be an atom, it could be a bottle of water, whatever, just some system, some physical system. And we're going to say, we're going to start from looking at the pure states for this system. So states of sort of definite ways that things can be. Uh, and we're going to call the set of these things omega p. It's not really important. We just have some set. And then sort of the measurements that we can perform on this system are going to have outcomes. Uh, from, and I'm going to call those e in this set of uh, 
all possible outcomes for all possible measurements, calligraphic O. And what, a, what a, our theory has to do is it has to tell us, okay, if the system was in a particular state, say S, little s, then what, what is the probability of seeing this outcome if I were to perform that measurement? And so every measurement outcome for every possible uh, measurement has to define a map from the set of pure states to the unit interval. And then a measurement is just a collection of these outcomes such that they're normalized in kind of the obvious sense, such that every state, at least one outcome will occur uh, in every run of the experiment. So that we get, at the end of the day, a normalized probability distribution over the, over the outcomes, uh, little k. OK, uh, this starts to get a bit ugly. I apologize for that. But the, the next thing I want to move to is to talk about ensembles. So suppose that we have this physical system with the different possible ways it can be, the different pure states. Then it's very natural to consider that I might just not know which state it's in. Doesn't mean it's not in one of those states, but I just might happen to be ignorant as to which it is. So we can describe these by ensembles. So it's just some uh, collection of these pairs. We have some probability PI, some state, uh, some pure state SI and the, the probabilities form a probability distribution over the, the set of pure states. Uh, and I'm going to call this thing uh, for ensemble. This is the collection of all possible ensembles. And classical probability theory tells us exactly what we need to do in order to uh, make predictions in this situation. I simply take sort of the linear combination of, uh, sorry, the convex combination of uh, the probabilities for each of the, the states uh, with the appropriate weights. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to define a notion of when two ensembles are equivalent to one another, which I denote by this tilde symbol. So we can say that two ensembles are equivalent if they lead to the same probabilities for all measurement outcomes. This means that uh, whatever measurement I do, I can't distinguish them. And the way that we describe mixed states in this formalism is basically by quotienting with respect to this equivalence relation. So we say that uh, mixed states always have sort of some way of distinguishing them via some measurement. So may maybe I should uh, try and illustrate this slightly with an example. So in, in quantum theory, the pure states would be the rays in the Hilbert space. Ensembles would then be uh, the, well, ensembles of rays and Hilbert spaces, but then the mixed states that you get when you quotient are just the density matrices that we're used to. So from this perspective, a density matrix really is representing an equivalence class of ensembles that are indistinguishable uh, by any measurements. And, and what we, what's, what's highlighted by this sort of way of presenting the GPT formalism is that the set of mixed states that we get, it really depends on the measurements that we decide we can perform in the theory. So if we change what measurements we can consider, then we're going to have to redo this. We're going to have to, again, say, OK, now that I've changed the measurements, uh, which ensembles now are equivalent to one another and which aren't. So the set of mixed states, the convex set of mixed states, is going to vary depending on which measurements we can perform. But sort of the, the, when we were talking about ensembles, I was saying that we could think of the sort of the probabilities in the ensemble as just representing our uncertainty about which state we have. Well, the same sort of goes through to the, uh, the convex geometry of the mixed states as well. So we have some arbitrary convex set of uh, mixed states, and then a probabilistic combination of these we think of as just uncertainty about which of these mixed states is describing the, the system of interest. And in particular, then we can see that the, the measurement outcomes that we introduced as mapped from pure states to the unit interval can be uniquely extended to, to maps now from the set of, conv uh, of mixed states to the unit interval, such that it's convex linear in this sense. And these, uh, the extension to the mixed states, it, uh, these things are known as effects. So then some arbitrary GPT system is really characterized by this pair. We've got the pair, we've got the mixed states, omega, and we've got the effects, uh, this calligraphic E.
Okay, so we can now talk about what it means for a particular GPG system characterized by these, this pair to be classical and to be quantum. So the classical systems have a particular feature or two particular features. One is that any mixed state admits a unique decomposition into the pure states of the theory. And then on the, on the effect side, we find that all of the measurements in classical theory are compatible with one another. There's no notion of incompatibility classically. Uh, and these two ideas, when you look at the convex geometry associated to it, tell us that the classical systems are represented by simplices and as the uh, set of mixed states and by sort of hypercubes uh, as uh, the, the effect space. Uh, and this is the dual of the simplex. So the simplex you can think of as the probability simplex over the different uh, states, and the hypercube is like the set of response functions uh, for, uh, for that set. Uh, in contrast, uh, quantum systems, we, we saw on Howard's talk yesterday, can be characterized in various different ways, um, one of which is by this triple of, of assumptions. Uh, which, which I won't go into now, um, but just to say that you can sort of find these principles that single out quantum systems. And then we end up with the usual set of density matrices and POVM elements. So like in the two dimensional case, you'd have the block sphere and then the, this sort of double ice cream cone shaped thing for the effect space. Which should really be in like one higher dimension, but I can't draw that. So this is like a slice to it. Okay, so these, these are the notions of classicality and quantum uh, quantumality uh, that uh, we're going to work with uh, here. Uh, uh, good question, Howard. <laughs> it's just a convex abstraction of the fact that the uh, generators of reversible evolution, so the Hamiltonians are all one-to-one -one correlated linearly with Hermitian operators. So the Lie algebra elements are also observables. Uh, you can state that abstractly in convex terms. Thanks. Uh, it won't really be relevant for the rest of the talk, but yeah, thank you. OK, so this, this is how we characterize quantum and classical theory from the, or one way of characterizing these two theories from the perspective of GPTs. So I've talked about states and effects, but uh, another very important part of any physical theory are the transformations, the dynamics of the theory. So if we have one GPT system A and another one B, then we can consider the set of transformations that transforms system A into system B. We could equally consider both systems being the same, so it could be transformations from A to A, but this is slightly more general, so we'll, we'll define things like this. And basically it's just a convex linear map from the states of one system to the states of another system. And again, the sort of the idea that this convex, uh, these convex mixtures really are just representing our ignorance as to what state we have. I think it's clear that the transformation should be convex linear because doing a transformation, just applying a transformation to the system can't tell us which state we started with. So our sort of ignorance remains the same. But a, a very important thing to note is that transformations don't just transform states to states, but we can also think of them as mapping effects to effects or measurement outcomes to measurement outcomes. So we get sort of this adjoint action. Uh, this, is like, this is like the Heisenberg picture rather than the Schrodinger picture of, of dynamics. Uh, and the way you can define this in GPTs is, is very simple. We just say that the, the action of the transformation on effects is by precomposition with this transformation. So we get a new measurement by first transforming the system and then measuring it with one of our old measurements. So uh, more concretely, maybe we have that this new uh, effect applied to the state S simply means you've, ah, I've written this wrong. The, the, this should be uh, the effect applied to T S, sorry. Clearly some, some good talk was happening while I was writing this slide. <laughs> okay, and, and this will be important uh, because what this means, as I said before, is that the, the possible measurements in the theory are not independent of the possible dynamics of the theory. We, again, like we saw that when we change the, the measurements, we change the states. 
Here we see that when we change the dynamics, we change the measurements. And so also we change the states. So all of the different elements of the theory are really closely interlinked with one another. So uh, an application of, of this is to uh, study the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which I think has been proposed in the context of uh, gravity and quantum theory, although I don't really know the, the backgrounds of it. Um, but I think that putting the nonlinear Schrodinger equation into the GPT formalism is quite revealing. I think it, uh, it's interesting, so I'm going to run through this now. So suppose that we, we have a spin half particle and we come up with some new dynamics for it that have this nonlinearity uh, in it. Then what this tells us is that we're going to have some new dynamics in the theory. We're going to have some new transformations in the theory. And in particular, what you can show is that you can always come up with new transformations which map any pair of pure states, so psi and phi, into some basis states, zero and one. So you can always, given any pair of pure states, you can always find some transformation uh, that, that does this uh, for you. But as we were just saying, if we have new dynamics, if we have new transformations, then we also have new measurements. So we can define this measurement in the GPT formalism. And what does this new measurement do? Well, it allows us to perfectly distinguish uh, psi and phi from one, one another. So we, we evolve them into uh, using t into zero and one, and then we just perform the standard uh, computational basis measurement. And this defines a new measurement, which allows us to perfectly distinguish any pair of states, not just orthogonal states. Uh, and so then we have new measurements. As I said, we then have to reconsider what the pure states look like in the theory. And so we find that now we can distinguish every state from every other state perfectly. So this very much changes which ensembles are equivalent to one another. And what this turns out to mean is that when we analyze uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation from the perspective of GPTs, then we actually find out that the set of states forms a simplex. OK, some infinite dimensional simplex uh, where the vertices now correspond to rays in Hilbert space, but it's basically a simplex. And so this is classical. So we have this weird situation where we've sort of tried to make quantum mechanics more weird by adding in this nonlinear term. And then we actually find out that it turns out that this makes it classical. So this is, I think, odd. And I think analyzing things from the perspective of GPTs allows us to uh, probe things on this, this deeper level and see that sort of intuitions that we might have about uh, theories uh, break down. Okay, so so far I've been just talking about single systems, uh, their states, their effects, and how they transform. But it's also important with, uh, within the formalism to talk about composite systems. So if we have a pair of different systems, A and B, within the GPT, then we should be able to consider them together as one composite system, uh, which I'll denote by this uh, dot, A dot B. And what this means is that if we have a state of system A and a state of system B, then we should be able to compose these together in parallel, and this should define a state of uh, the composite system. And similarly, for measurements, if we can measure, measure A and we can measure B, then we can perform both measurements at the same time and measure the composite system. Similarly, for transformations, if we can transform A and we can transform AB uh, and B, then we can transform the composite AB. But we, we sort of can't define this arbitrarily. There's going to have to be a bunch of constraints that these things must satisfy. I say they're obvious, they're sort of obvious in, in retrospect, but actually coming up with the full list of these things is uh, very much non-obvious. But I think all of, the, all of the constraints that you need to impose, at least, are very natural once you've identified them. So to give one example, uh, we have associativity of composition. But if I have three systems, then it doesn't really matter whether I group them into the first two and the third one, or into the first one and then the second and the third. These should be the same, the same composite system. Similarly, if I, you have a transformation from A to B and a transformation from B to C, then I can consider the composite transformation that goes from A to, to C. And this composition, again, should be associative. Um, 
what this means at the end of the day is that any generalized probabilistic theory defines a symmetric model category. Um, people in the audience may well not be familiar with what these are. Um, it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, the key thing is that this means that we get a nice diagrammatic representation of our GPTs. And from this diagrammatic representation, you can actually show that it's a symmetric model category and you can drive all of these constraints that I said uh, you obviously need to impose. So let me briefly introduce this diagrammatic formalism. So the, the systems are going to be represented by labeled wires. Uh, so this is a composite of system A, system B, and system C. And we're going to read these diagrams from bottom to top. So it's sort of time flows upwards. And then the sort of diagrams that we can draw look, look kind of like this. So this, we have S here, is something without an input, but it's got an output, which is the composite of A and B. So this is some sort of state of the system, A, B. And then we have a transformation, say T prime, which goes from the composite system C, A to the composite system B, D. And then uh, this E doesn't have an outcome, uh, doesn't have an output. So this corresponds to some measurement outcome. This is one of the effects. And when we compose these things together, this tells us that we should get some sort of new transformation in this case, from two copies of the system C to a system uh, B and a system C. And what all of these consistency conditions that I talked about earlier tell you is that the, what, uh, it doesn't matter exactly how you draw the diagram on the page, it should correspond to the same uh, transformation overall. So I can sort of bend things around, I can swap over the T and T prime in this example, and as long as things are sort of connected up in the same way, then this describes the same uh, physical process. Um, we can also uh, introduce sort of convex combinations into this diagrammatic formalism. And the, the nice thing is that if we take some sort of convex combination of transformations at one point in the diagram, I can equivalently sort of compose the diagram first and then take the convex combinations. So this shows that all of the transformations and all of the notions of composition that we introduce are convex linear or, or biconvex linear. So, so this is a useful tool to have around. Okay, so this is my sort of brief introduction to the formalism of GPTs. I, I think the key messages so far are that really very sort of basic operational ideas about probabilities and how you assign probabilities to, to states and how you can compose things uh, in an operational sense. These basic ideas lead to a, a very rich mathematical structure. We get sort of these, this particular kind of symmetric monoidal category equipped with uh, a bunch of convex structure. So it's a, it's a non-trivial mathematical structure, but it's come from very sort of basic conceptual ideas. Um, another important point is that defining GPTs is, is hard. Like you have to define all of these different elements and then check that all of the consistency conditions are satisfied in order to actually have a, a GPT to hand. And as we saw from the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, doing modifications to uh, GPTs, such as quantum theory, this is also hard. Like we change one thing, we have to reconsider everything else in the theory. And, and you'll notice that I introduced the nonlinear Schrodinger equation before I talked about composite systems. And that's basically because we don't know how, at this moment, how to deal with composite systems with nonlinear Schrodinger equations. So we can do it for single systems, but going beyond that, is, is difficult. <laughs> okay, so returning now to like the main, the main point of this talk is this, this thought experiment. So how can we uh, cast this in the language of GPTs? So we can see that we've got sort of three systems of interest here. We've got the system A, we've got the system B, which are like our test masses. And then we've got the gravitational field, G, which we're just going to simply model as another system in the GPT. So I guess I should pop back a couple of slides and make the point that even though these systems, we draw them as wires, as if they're like world lines in space time, uh, they really, a lot of the time, should not be thought of that. So these aren't necessarily localized in, in space in any sense. So e even if you've got something like a field, you can still say that this is some system. Uh, just one that isn't localized. And so you sort of have to take care when you look at the diagrams not to immediately uh, make this sort of space-time interpretation of them. 
Okay, so we've got these three systems. We've got A, B, which we're interested in whether they become entangled or not. And we've got this uh, gravitational field G. And we're going to assume, um, because this is kind of what the set of the experiment tells us, that they interact only via the gravitational field. So this means something like we have an interaction between A and B, and this factorizes in this sense that it's mediated by the system G. It might be more complicated, which we'll, we'll see in a, in a bit, but this is just an example of what we mean by uh, the system G mediating uh, the interaction. So then the experiment, the question, the key question is, okay, if we observe that A and B can become entangled by this transformation, then what can we conclude about the GPT system G? Can we conclude that it's quantum, for example? Um, before we can do that, though, I should tell you what entanglement in GPTs means, because it's not obvious that it's good. Well, we have definition in quantum theory, but in this more general framework, uh, it needs to be defined. So we say that a state uh, sigma in some uh, bipartite state space, uh, omega AB, is separable if and only if it can be decomposed in this way as some convex combination of product states. Um, so this is just very straightforward generalization of the definition in quantum theory. And then, okay, if it's not separable, it's entangled. So again, straightforward uh, adaptation of quantum theory. Nothing surprising is going on here. Okay, so now I can get to the no-go theorem that we, we proved. So suppose we have two GPT systems, A and B, uh, and they're interacting with this gravitational field system, G, via some transformation, we'll call it T. Then the following conditions cannot be jointly satisfied. We can't have, at the same time, that the gravitational field is classical, in the sense of being a classical GPT, uh, that it mediates the in interaction in the sense that uh, a and B don't have sort of direct interaction, but only via uh, the gravitational field, and that we uh, obtain entanglement between the, uh, the two particles. So I'm, I'm going to very briefly sketch the proof of this because it, I think it's very simple and intuitive, uh, even if you're not that familiar with the GPT formalism. So condition two uh, was that the gravitational field is the mediator of the entanglement, uh, of the mediator of the interaction. And by this, we just mean that we have the transformation T that may or may not end up with uh, entanglement between the two particles. And it decomposes in this sense that we have the gravitational field mediating between the two and never so a direct uh, evolution between A and B themselves. So G is always sort of in between uh, the two systems. Then we assume using condition one that the gravitational field is, is classical. Um, so I'm just now drawing it by red line to highlight the fact it's classical. This is nothing's really happened here um, on the diagram. But then we can just sort of stretch things about a bit and see that Really, what this is describing is we can think of as being two parties, say Alice on the left and Bob on the right, and they're swapping backwards and forwards a classical system between them. So this is just an LOCC, Local Operations and Classical Communication Protocol, which everyone here is probably familiar with from quantum information literature. And it's not difficult to show that just as in quantum theory, LOCC cannot generate entanglement, that also in any other GPT as well, uh, LOCC cannot generate entanglement. Okay, so I'm going to now briefly, how much time do I have left, by the way? Five minutes left. Oh, wow, I'm taking more time than I thought. Right. Okay, so I'll now briefly uh, talk about the different conditions uh, and try and look at situations where you may or may not think they should be, should be satisfied. So the first condition um, was that uh, gravity is classical. And you, you may want to subscribe to that idea if you think, well, we don't know how to quantize gravity, so maybe we should give up and just say gravity is classical. Uh, so that might be one reason you would endorse that. Um, 
but we can find, well, okay, I don't think that's a great motivation, but um, we can then find examples which violate condition one, but satisfy conditions two and three, uh, the obvious example being quantum theory. Uh, quantum theory can mediate entanglement. Uh, if, if the system G is quantum, then we can satisfy uh, the rest of the conditions. Um, the second condition was that G mediates the entanglement, uh, the interaction, sorry. And this is really like the set of the experiment. This is why you would want to endorse that. I mean, of course, experimental considerations might come into play and you might say that for some reason in principle, uh, it's impossible to make it the case that only, they only interact gravitationally. But I think this is quite a reasonable condition. Um, but an example of where this might be violated is if, say, you imagine that gravity is just some sort of parameter uh, in sort of uh, a description of a unitary that interacts systems A and B, uh, and it doesn't have any sort of physical system at all associated to it. Um, I, I think there's uh, yeah, good reasons to not believe that's the case, though. Okay, and then the third condition uh, was that entanglement is observed, and you would might believe this should be the case because it's really like a direct application of the superposition principle in, in quantum theory. So if you just try and analyze things in the most sort of straightforward way, you'll see that entanglement appears. But there are models that violate this uh, assumption, such as spontaneous collapse models, where uh, the collapse uh, might happen before the entanglement can be can be generated. Okay, so the, the benefits of using the GPT approach to analyze this, um, I think I've got three of these. The, the first is that they ensure that you have a consistent theory without making you subscribe to too many ontological commitments. So we haven't had to say what the nature of the gravitational field is, whether it's particles, whether it's a, whatever it is, it's just some system. Uh, and we also use this to sort of classify existing approaches to analyzing this experiment um, by putting them first into the GPT formalism and then studying which of the, our uh, conditions are violated by them. But I, th I think most interestingly to me is that uh, this allows us to go beyond just talking about quantum systems or classical systems. That we don't have to assume that the systems A and B are quantum systems, or uh, they could be something else. And also, we don't have to assume that the system G is either quantum or classical. We can also consider that being something else as well. So this sort of result can be robust to future modifications of the theory. Um, so we talked already about uh, the systems A and B being, uh, well, they could be non-quantum. They could be something like the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but that's uh, classical, so it's not so interesting. We could think that maybe they uh, have high rod interference that we heard about on, on Tuesday. Um, or there's a nice paper by, by Marcus, uh, which is at this archive reference here, where they talk about how uh, when you go to very small scales, then sort of the block sphere or probabilities might become fuzzy or discretized. And so if that were the case, then you want sort of these no-go theorems to be robust to that sort of modification, which, which this one is. Um, but we can also find examples of theories where the gravitational field can entangle uh, quantum particles, but isn't quantum theory. So this, I think, challenges uh, the standard answer, which is that if we see entanglement, then we can say that the field should be quantum, because now we have examples where the field, okay, it's not classical, but it's also not quantum either. So. A couple of these uh, need some thought going into them, but I believe that the theories based on Euclidean Jordan algebras should be able to entangle uh, quantum particles. Um, so there's a nice paper where they uh, define like a full compositional framework uh, for Euclidean Jordan algebras. Um, secondly, there's the theory of density cubes, uh, which um, I think, uh, although we, we don't have a proof of this yet, uh, can lead to entanglement uh, via a non-quantum system. And the one that I'm most confident in is uh, this theory of density hypercubes, um, which um, I'll now, I don't really have time left, but it's extremely simple to see that these, at least if you know the theory, can generate entanglement. 
So basically, it goes as follows that we, we, in the theory of density hypercubes, you can always factorize any quantum system through one of these sort of hyper quantum systems, H, which I've drawn in purple here. So the identity can sort of first embed the quantum system in this bigger system and then uh, recover it. So then you can take any quantum protocol that you like. You can embed the quantum system mediating with one of these hyper quantum systems mediating, and then we get some beyond quantum protocol. So this is a, a concrete example of how just seeing entanglement in this experiment isn't enough to conclude that uh, this field is quantum. It could also be one of these more exotic things as well. OK, uh, so what do we learn from this GPT analysis? Well, for one thing, we learned that it's possible to analyze these uh, experiments in this language. And that if we see entanglement in this experiment, then we need to take care over uh, what it means. If we witness entanglement, then this is good evidence of the gravitational field not being uh, classical, but it's not such good evidence for it not being, uh, it's not such good evidence for it being quantum uh, because we have these alternatives. Okay, so then to just finish with some open questions. Um, one may want to go to a sort of a more refined notion of non-classicality than what I introduced here. So the, the notion of classicality of uh, this system being a simplex is quite a strong notion of uh, non-classicality, of classicality, sorry. And there's more refined notions such as contextuality, uh, which I think would be interesting to consider. But I think the, the, the big open question is, OK, so we've seen that this particular experiment doesn't tell us if we see entanglement that we've got uh, the gravitational field being quantum. But are there more refined experiments that we can come up with that, that do allow us to make that conclusion? I think people should think about this and try and uh, come up with such experiments. Or conversely, the theories that I've introduced that allow for non-quantum systems to mediate entanglement are there some nice principles that might rule those out that say that, OK, we've got these exotic theories, but they're not worth considering for some, some reason? Um, and yeah, I just want to conclude that I think there's a lot more that can be done with GPTs in this, in this area. Um, and actually, there's some, some work already, in particular by Marcus Muller on, uh, and others in the audience, I think, on looking at, say, the black hole information loss uh, in uh, GPTs and obtaining constraints on generalized probabilistic theories by considering uh, ideas coming from uh, relativity, such as uh, lack of simultaneity. OK, so I just want to put up the archive reference uh, at the end and also Flaminia's talk uh, if you want to see more about this stuff. Thanks for listening. All right, so we've only gone a few minutes into the period. Um, why don't we start with some questions from the audience? Carlo? Um, I have two questions. If it's too long, you can just get me, get me out. So the first question is that uh, um, if GPT is so general, then there's an immediate question. I mean, uh, would the, the structure of quantum gravity I described in, in the previous lecture fit it or not? And the, the specific is, uh, Dynamics not given by a transformation, it's given in a completely different manner. So that's the first question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I don't think anyone has done this. So this is just one, put it as a yeah, I, I think it's challenge, a, if you want yeah, to. Say, so. I think it's a good challenge, definitely. And the second is, is about the alternatives. It, it, it seems to me as a general issue of principle, I mean, it, an experiment never proves a theory, an experiment that never proves anything, if you want. An experiment just proves that, uh, it might, might, at, at most it can disprove something, even that is questionable, but it's a... Uh, so, um, uh, the, the problem of quantum gravity is put up a theory that has a large number of things to be consistent with. Um, the fact that, so we have some theories of quantum gravity today, all of which predict that the entanglement will come out, and some other tentative theories of quantum gravity which, uh, uh, that, that, that say that gravity is classical because it collapses first or because it's just classical all the way through. That, uh, so the, the, an experiment would at most advocate, adjudicate between these two. I mean, 
would it make sense to have a, uh, an experiment that proves that the, that uh, that gravity is quantum? I don't I don't think this could be could be reasonable. I don't think anybody would would claim this. And in particular, what you call the alternatives are not theories of quantum gravity. Are ideas of what could happen. So, uh, if, if the question is about quantum gravity, these alternatives are relevant because they're not tentative theories for quantum gravity. So, I'm confused about what is being doing here. Uh, so, I agree that these, these are not sort of full-fledged uh, theories of quantum gravity. Um, and I, I think I, I put them up mainly as sort of toy examples of seeing essentially that you should be careful of what conclusions you draw from these, these experiments that... Right, but nobody would ever pretend that an experiment to confirm a theory or even a class of theories, right? Why should one demand that? If you have a theorem that, if you have an ex experiment with two possible outcomes and two theories that predict two opposite things, at most it could count of evidence for one or the other. And as a general matter of philosopher physics, mm -hmm. it seems to me. I should think about this point. Sorry for <laughs> so. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, let's go to a couple of on online questions now. Okay. Yeah. So ask your question if you're. Uh... Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I assume that you can hear me. Uh, yes. Thanks for the talk. It was very enlightening. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I similar to Carlo. Uh, if it's possible, I also have two questions. Um, but if not, it's okay. The first one. Um, it's maybe I didn't read it from the formalism. So um, it's the pure states that you use to form this GPT. Um, do they subscribe to the Leibniz principle? So can I have two different states that any measurement that I apply to them, that they are different states, but the measurement outcome is the same? Um, so in how I introduced the formalism here, uh, there is no necessity of that, but I think it would be a very natural uh, thing to demand. And I think, yeah, t typically that probably is, is, is assumed. Uh, but strictly how I wrote it, yeah, it, that isn't uh, part of the formalism. Okay, no, no, like I would prefer that it's not assumed. So like, uh, <laughs> but like then the question is, can I not assume that in, and still use GPTs? Right, was yeah. there another question? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. The, the second question is the way you define separable states, um, like in the way that it de decomposes as the product states, right? Mm -hmm. um, does that definition come from an operational point of view or is just um, from the analogy of uh, the qubit case? Um, so, so it Either way is fine. I think you can operationally motivate it or you can just view it as a straightforward mathematical generalization. O operationally, I think you can always think of these states as ones where you can have some shared randomness, sh shared classical randomness uh, between the two parties who then locally prepare states conditioned on that. Uh, and that, that is an equivalent definition. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll send you an email. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. Very much. And do we have another online question? Okay, Sugato, well, so, uh, hi, hi, no. yeah, hello. Uh, thanks, thanks for this very interesting talk. Uh, so I was wondering this last theory you were talking about, the, the say the hypercubic uh, theory. So, are are there any predictions it makes like beyond quantum mechanics? For example, does it do something like a PR box or, or something? Or I mean. Uh, you know. I, I think this uh, isn't known fully yet. Like it's quite a new theory, and uh, people haven't yet explored mm -hmm. what, like the consequences, the sort of operational consequences of it. Um, it it's got some strange features, though. Um, in particular, is, is there's a, a way that this theory reduces to quantum theory in in something very like a decoherence mechanism. Mm. Um, so, sort of, it can reproduce all of the predictions of quantum theory in this particular limit. But the way that the decoherence works uh, is strange in that it, uh, I think quantum classical decoherence is something that uh, happens deterministically by just forgetting some information, say. Mm -hmm. uh, but this 
decoherence from the hypercubes to the to quantum theory happens only probabilistically. So with some probability, the decoherence can happen. And then you're sort of at that point forever in this decohered branch, but then maybe something else happens as well. So it's, it's kind of a strange theory in that sense. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done on understanding all of the consequences of it. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So do we have any questions from the hall? Uh, if not, um, yeah, let's, let's break. And let's thank uh, all the speakers in this session again. Thank you.